Hi there, everybody. My name is Laura, and welcome to the Writer Position Fix It Show, where we discuss writing topics and share ideas and exercises to help you and your writers. Stay tuned because I know we're going to have some exercises that you are going to love. Today, I'd like to welcome Jenny Paisley and Jay Duke. Jay Duke is a Canadian equestrian team member, Equestrian Canada senior course designer, and host of the Jay Duke Show Monday evenings on the Jumping Instructors Network. And our special guest today is Jenny Paisley. Hi, Jenny. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we're excited to have you here. Uh, Jenny Paisley is a USEF large R hunter, jumper, equitation, hunter, breeder, judge. She also likes to travel and do clinics. So if you're interested in having Jenny as a clinician, please give us some comments and uh, contact her. We'd love that. So uh, Patty Downing Nygaard is our usual host, but unfortunately she wasn't able to be here today. So we have Jay who's stepping in and to help us out today. I'm Jay, where are you coming in from? Hey, I'm, I'm uh, broadcasting from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada today. Excellent. And where are you coming from, Jenny? I'm coming from Corrales, New Mexico in the Southwest. Oh, wow. New Mexico. Nice. Yep. So we got a broad, uh, a broad uh, spectrum of things going on here. So uh, we thought that we, uh, we would start off with some exercise, well, not exercises. What did you have for us, Jenny? You wanted to talk about keeping over your leg? Um, yes, I like developing a nice strong leg position which helps your body overall. And I um, do that with, I call it the standing up position. Okay. And you grab, a chunk, you grab a chunk of mane while you're walking around starting out for the day and you stand straight up. So your shoulders to your hips, to your knees, to your ankles are in line. And that helps you know your lower leg position very well because if your leg goes forward, you sit down. If your leg goes back, you fall forward. And you just get strong upper leg to hold you in place. And it just helps you become a very strong rider. So how do you know if your rider, if your students or rider needs this exercise? I believe everybody needs it a little bit. I do it when we're walking around just letting the horse warming up. And I just stand up and stretch down through my legs and adjust my position. When I was a child, I did it at the walk, trot, and canter. And when I was really crazy, I could do it without my stirrups. But I'm not that crazy anymore. <laughs> Is that the picture that, that you have for us? You want me I to show I, that? One of my students was show, I just asked him for a quick picture so I could show what it is because it's not the two point. In fact, I would like to see his shoulder back over his hip a little more. So you're kind of up over the pommel. It's not a position you would see at a horse show unless you wanted to practice your position. So you kind of wanted something like where that red line is? Yeah, or your hip, his hip even up more, kind of up in front. And it's more just to feel how your lower leg relaxes down from your knee into your ankle. And I like the weight of your weight go down to the inside of your ankle so that your foot turns out to the one o'clock position just a little bit. We have a picture of that too. Um, so, I like what you say there, that one o'clock position, that's a, uh, that's a great way of describing it. So if yeah. this was, now you have to remember some of the people watching here are people who have never read a analog clock. Well, so, so you would just be it's more true. On the inside my son of your is, foot. My, my son is 21 and I don't know that he's ever read an analog clock. So, right. but so if this is noon, right. one o'clock would be. Boop. Yeah, it just, you're, so your calf can get closer to the horse's side and your toe would turn out a teeny tiny bit and the weight's down the inside of your, your foot and your stirrup. So you're almost trying to show someone a little bit of the bottom of your foot. Because then for me, from your knee to your ankle, you have a nice position to be on your horse's side when you need it. That's what I find. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I think, you know, so many people get bored with the flat work. But one thing that you can do to improve your riding and also keep your flat work interesting is do certain exercises in different positions. So yeah, go, go ahead and and you can do, say, a simple flat work pattern 
you can do that, you know, standing up in your stirrups, you can do it in the two point, you can do it in a half seat. You can do that exercise sitting down. You can do that exercise without your stirrups. You can do that exercise rising trot without your stirrups. You can do that same exercise with one stirrup and the two point or rising. Trot. There's so many variations you can do with a simple exercise that's not putting excess of say strain on your horse, but it's greatly improving your riding, improving your balance, improving your strength. And so um, I think it's important that riders can ride from different positions because different horses require different positions as well. So riders should be equally proficient in the two point half seat and in the three point deep seat. And so the only way to get proficient at it is to practice that. I think I see a lot of people doing all their flat work in the rising trot. Well, that's pretty easy. Um, everyone can do rising trot. I could, you know, you could put your, your dog in the saddle and they could do the rising trot on your horse. <laughs> so, you know, practice, practice these different positions and work on your balance. And uh, you'll, you'll find an amazing uh, improvement in your riding very quickly. Yes. Yeah, I totally. I agree. And uh, I like what, what you say, try it with one strip, try it with both strip, try it at the sitting trot, try it the, all these different ways. So um, we do have this picture here. Jenny, maybe you could walk us through this too, of what it is that we're looking at here. Is this the well, one o'clock position that you were talking about yeah. or? Yes. And on the left side, it's the 11 o'clock, but it just, it's his ankles getting a little bit of a coming in and his foot goes a little bit back out. So I call it cocking my foot, just a hair, which then just allows your lower leg to rest on the horse's side very simply. So you don't have to move it to find the horse. So, um, yes, that's just the angle of it's not having the toe turned out. It's just having it sort of, I call it caulking. It just comes through the inside of your ankle and you push on the inside of your foot. So that's my rendition of a good lower leg. What would, so Jenny, what would you recommend as far as the angle of the toe? Um, you know, so say the toe straight ahead is say zero degrees. And then if it was say pointing to the, middle of the arena it'd be 90 degrees where do you feel the best angle for for that the ankle would be the ankle the ankle is going in 10 degrees say and the foot goes out 10 degrees you're just okay. getting a little bit of a, a cocking i don't know a better word oh, so for that. that's like <laughs> that's like right here you're talking about Yes. Yeah, that, that yes. angle there. Yeah, so ten, 10 degrees is what you're saying. So the toe. Yes, would be not a lot, not a lot, but just enough to allow your lower calf to get closer to the horse. Okay. Because if your foot stays flat, your your calf is pushed flat away from the horse, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so it just right. allows so, you. So a, a long time ago, well, when I was taught to ride, I was taught to toes straight ahead. Correct. Which I guess we are saying is, okay, that's really not correct because that means that your calf can't really get on the horse. So you're saying turn your toes out slightly with the weight, would the weight be onto your Inside. big toe slightly so that correct. you can get your calf against the horse's side? Yes, that's how it worked best for me. So that's how I kind of teach. And that's what I see the most. I mean, I, I should have brought a bunch of pictures, but you can see a whole lot of people end up there because that's just how they naturally get in a good place. And yeah, that's the, the American forward system style is, is riding with the toe slightly out and then the knee slightly off the saddle. So you have contact through the calf and through the thigh. And that's the style of system that Jenny teaches and I teach and about 10,000 other <laughs> American coaches teach as yeah. well. Um, and it works. It's not the only way to no. do it. You see, you see alternatives. There's many ways, yes. Um, but that is the American forward system. And that's, you know, it, it, it certainly works. It's, it's a wonderful position. Well, and I think that, what, you know, as instructors and teachers that you – see a lot of people that don't have their lower leg on securely and it causes a lot of problems. Right. I feel that the lower leg supports the upper body. It's sort of like a teeter totter. And if you have a weak lower leg, then you sort of have a weak upper body and it's all controlled through the hip angle of your, how straight up and down you want to be or how bent in the two point and all of that. So yes, I think the lower leg is very important. Yeah, I, I agree, of course, and we spend so many hours on it working. That's your base of support. So that's right. where it all starts. So, and, and 
you'll, you'll see some top, top international riders that, you know, um, you, you could certainly pull up pictures of, say, Richard Spooner, who is a tremendous talent. Uh, Burton Allen from Ireland, who is a superstar of the sport as well. And, and riders could say, well, what about their lower leg? You know, look where, look where it is. Um, but again, no, wait a minute about style. Richard Spooner. Was there not a video on YouTube where the horse did something astronomical and he had to drop his reins? Yeah. It was and he had to, right through yeah, but, but exactly. But that comes from a solid position, right? Correct. Sorry to interrupt you, Jay. I'm sorry if I interrupted you. No, he was fabulous no. there, and he, he kept his leg down and his body tall to help the horse not be in trouble, where if he jumped up his neck, it would have been a huge mess. Um, I, I also want to say that I got the pleasure of having a nice Grand Prix horse that used to jump me out of his hack all the time, and I found with him, my lower leg would actually come up in the air to hold me on. So I'm not saying that you'll never get out of the position. You must do what works for you and your horse. But I still practice to have the good position. But when he'd go leaping me out of the ground, out of the tack, I would do almost anything I could to hang tight. So it's 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 interesting. There are no set perfect permanent rules in riding. It all changes day to day. So Jenny, with this uh, this picture here, we're showing now the, with the rider standing up in his stirrups. How does this exercise help your uh, lower leg? How, well, how do you uh, use this exercise to help your lower leg, I guess, maybe I should say? Well, I start my day out with just having everyone stretch down into their legs. So at the walk, we're walking and we're standing up and we're not in the two point because then to me, your bottom goes out too far. So I, we, I have them standing straight up, holding on to the mane because, again, you don't want to haul on the horse's mouth if you lose your balance. And you learn that your knee and your ankle are shock absorbers and you can learn to you hold on with your upper leg and then your lower leg is your gas pedal. So you learn how to use your knee and your ankle as your shock absorber so you can use your leg independently. Does that make any sense? And for me, relaxing down into the heel as opposed to pushing, telling people to push their heels down. You have to relax down into your heel and then it all falls into place. And by putting all your weight down in your stirrups, you're pretty much pushing them down. So that's, that's how I found that it helps me. So I start out, I try to have my people walk around the ring once standing up. If they're, you know, more advanced, I'll have them hold the mane and we'll trot off and we'll stay trotting for a little bit and then we'll post. But it's just a matter of getting fit and learning how to hold yourself on the top part of your leg. So your lower leg is independent. And how is this different than the two point that we, that, you know, that we're seeing? Well, for me, the two point puts your rear end behind you, which forces you to rest on their neck or use, you know, it, I just like it to feel how my lower leg can balance my upper body. It's like when you ride down a hill with a horse, you need to straighten your knee a bit and get your lower foot in front of you. So your upper body stays off. So it gives you a little more of the teeter totter balance for it, for me. Um, it, it, the two points, the next best thing, but I created the straight up and down because then I don't know. I just felt it made a better lower leg. Jay, do you, you, do you use this exercise, the standing straight up? Yes. Yes. I yeah. did it as a rider, uh, when I rode and, um, I do do it with my riders. Um, okay. You know, it, it's not an everyday thing, of course, but, um, yeah, I would say we probably do this, you know, for sure. Certainly every month spend some time on it. Um, again, people don't practice it. So it's, it's a great right. exercise for balance. And then if you get them up there and then say, okay, now have them do a circle. And again, at the walk, this doesn't have to be anything advanced. Um, but you could do it, you know, have them do a circle at the walk, have them, um, you know, go through a little steering exercise, maybe through some poles or, or pylons or, or things like that. Um, yeah, so it's it's so anything to do with balance on a horse is is a good thing. So whether you're you know you're standing up or you're bareback, um, you know pra practice different positions and practice different balance points. It will definitely pay off in the long run for you. I think that steering would be, you know, I'm I'm trying to imagine standing up in your stirrups and asking your riders to steer, do a circle, move through pylons, all those things where forces you to coordinate and shift your balance and look around and 
pat your head and rub your tummy type type of things, right? I mean, that's what we're talking yes. about. An mm -hmm. independent seat and developing your base of support over your lower leg. Yes, it makes everything get a little more independent. And the more you have muscle memory of how to do it, the less you have to think about it when it's time. Uh, so uh, while we're discussing things here, if you have any questions or comments, please put it in the comments. We get those comments live. And if you have questions, we can answer those questions directly right here on the program. Or you, we can ask them, uh, if you're watching the replay, ask them as well, because we'll watch that. But if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put it in the comments. We'd love to hear from you to hear what you think about what's going on here today. Also remember to give us a thumbs up and share this video with your friends, or if you know anybody who you think should be here, share it with them. We'd love for, for the information to get around. Now, Jenny, there was something else you wanted to talk about today as well. Did I say that like a Canadian, about? About? No, I like it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Not um, bad. <laughs> well, the next most important thing that I love or need for watching riders ride and riding is a good arm or good hand contact to the mouth. And for me, I think people try to keep their hands still by being stiff. And I think the answer to getting it done well is having a relaxed elbow and a relaxed shoulder. And so that's what I call the greasy elbow. So when you post, you, your arm has to actually straighten and bend. And when you're cantering, your arm moves with the horse's head so that you're not bumping against their mouth. So, so I'm all about having relaxation in your riding. Sure. So that's, that's great. That's great. I'm sure that we all do. But the, so at what point in a rider's uh, program do they start to develop that greasy elbow? How can you even teach that, that feel that it's kind of a feeling thing of uh, like what you say, you don't bump the horse in the horse's mouth when you're cantering, but how, how do you develop that? That's a it's great, great question. to say, you know, yeah, we want them to be relaxed, but. Uh... Okay. Um, well, first of all, I'll walk up and I'll ask the person to raise their arm and then I'll let go and their arm will stay up there. And I'll say, no, I really want the arm to just fall back down. It wants to be soft. And then to feel this motion when you're posting is you just let your pinkies touch the neck. And to keep your pinky on the neck, your arm is going to start moving. And that's how you feel how to do that. So those are my ways of teaching that. And, and then once they feel it and they know it, then they can carry their own hand and not have to touch the neck. But otherwise, they don't realize their hand is going up and down with their body when they're posting. So. I, I, yeah. So Jay, how do you teach that? Yeah, that's, this is, I'd say the biggest error that we, that I see in riding, um, to me as a coach, the most important angle on the rider's body is from the elbow to the hand, to the bed. That's, that's the number. I mean, every angle is important, like the ankle angle and, and all of them, but the, the elbow angle is, is really key. And so how do you teach that? I've found a few different tricks um, to, tr to try to make it happen. Um, first of all, you just, you know, most people either carry their hand typically too low. You know, generally, if they're going to break that line from elbow to hand to bit, um, the hand's going to be too low. Some people carry it too high. It's probably about 70, 30, something like that. Um, so first of all, you just try to make them aware of how important that angle is. Um, I do explain to them that if a rider is feeling tension in their forearm or in their wrist, then if they're if they feel like they're pulling on their horse through and they feel that tension there, then they're doing it wrong. You should feel the contact through your elbow because then that's engaging the core of your body. Um, I consider the core when you're riding from the bottom of the rib cage to the middle of your thigh. So that puts your hips essentially in the center. And you want to feel when you're pulling on your horse and holding your horse, the contact that you, you're holding the horse through your core of your body. If you feel you're holding your horse through your fingers or through your wrist or forearm, then your angles are incorrect. So that's one way to do it. Another trick that I have um, for people to create that there's that question you're talking about there is feel, which is right. That um, is so hard is, is the driving rein. And the driving rein mm -hmm. is when you is a very old school trick. Uh, I learned it from Ann Krasinski, who's a wonderful advocate for the driving rein. It's this and way. That's, 
where you flip your hands over and hold it the other way, just like if you're driving a, a cart or a wagon. Instead no. of like this, it's like this through the top. Yeah, exactly. What well well illustrated. That's exactly right. And that creates um, uh, a, a softer, easier contact. It's almost impossible to lock your elbow in the driving rein. Mm -hmm. And so I like um, all my riders to use it. Um, I, we don't use it very often, but I like everyone to be able to use it um, as need be. Um, I know I'd be riding, you know, I'd have 10 horses that day and I'd be like, geez, every one of my horses is stiff on the left side. Well, obviously <laughs> they're not stiff on the left side. <laughs> That's coming for me. And so if I'd feel that, I would just flip my hands over to driving rein. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ride in the driving rein for the next couple of days and get myself balanced out and supple and get my horses balanced and supple. And so as a result, all of my students can do courses and compete. I've, I've been at Spruce Meadows with amateur students and, you know, there's the catching their horse in the mouth of the air. I said, flip your hand, go to the driving rein and stop pulling on your horse's mouth. And they're all comfortable doing that. So I found that to be um, a, a very good tool. And just to finish that point, I recommend if you're going to practice driving rein, do it for 30 days, practice it for 30 days and then go back to normal because it's not for, for everyone and not certainly not for every horse. But if you do it for that long, then you'll have it for the rest of your life as a tool. I, th I think it's really interesting, Jay, that uh, and Jenny, that something as simple as putting the rein through the top of your hand to ride, as opposed to through where your ring finger is, that can make your hand that much softer. I mean, why? Why is that? Why does that make your hand softer? Because I, I know it does. And, and if you do have a, a rider that doesn't feel or is tense, that's a great, simple tool to use. Well, why, changes, why do you think, why do, yeah, why do you think that makes it so much simpler? It changes the angle of your wrist. So you can't do puppy paws or cock your wrists or whatever. You're stuck with your wrist going straight, which now makes the elbow have to be the joint that works. So, yeah, it's a great tool. I interrupted Jay. Sorry. No, no, I was hoping no, you would answer that. Yeah. It, you know, that's exactly right. It, it makes the angle of the wrist correct and it correct it creates the correct angle on the elbow as well. So now all of a sudden your angles are correct and you're going to ride with feel and softer. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a great tool. It does, uh, you know, it does not work with very strong horses um, because you're in a weaker position as a rider. Um, it's excellent on sensitive horses. It's wonderful on thoroughbreds. Thoroughbreds love, love the driving rein. Um, and it's a real tool as far as like Ann Krasinski, she rode Grand Prix in it. Um, Luger Beerbaum won a gold medal on the very sensitive Retina Z in a driving rein. Um, so, you know, that's obviously top level. Um, I had a sensitive thoroughbred. I won three Grand Prix on that horse. Uh, Jenny Primaris, her name was King David. He was a good thoroughbred. Mm -hmm. And he had to go in a driving rein, a rubber snaffle in a driving rein, because you, you had to have that very, very sensitive feel. And it, it, so for certain horses and certain riders, it's, it's a great, great tool. tool. Yes. Yeah. So I wanted to share this. Oscar says, I feel stiff in my elbow. My instructor tells me to close my eyes to better feel the horse's mouth. That That's works. great. That works. I also enjoy putting my students on a lunge line and making them do all of this stuff with me having control of the horse. So they're safe because safety's first and shutting their eyes on the lunge line. And you'd be amazed at how much they feel their animal under them. So yeah, all the practicing and getting the feel of it and just spending time with your horse will make you a better rider. Uh, Sarah says, I love watching your live stream. Very good information. Thank you very much, Sarah. Appreciate that. Diane Carney says, Jenny's such a great rider. What's some of the, of the fun showing you did in the Southwest shows? <laughs> and did the horses you ride resemble the horses of today? What's well, some of the fun and did the horses you rode then resemble the horses of today? Um, my great junior hunter was alias Joe and he was a thoroughbred and he was nothing like the horses of today. <laughs> he was a weirdo and I worked around his weirdnesses and luckily I've learned to train horses better than back then. So I can fix some of the weirdnesses that he never was learned, but I think horses, thoroughbreds are just much more sensitive 
And I think it's um, for certain people, it's easier to ride a thoroughbred than a warm blood. But now we all ride warm blood. So everything's changed a bit. Um, but no, I love riding and I got to ride many great horses. And um, I was very blessed that way. Oops. So, um, so I would think the horses are different today. I think the horses um, are more trained. I think the horses are more broke for the people. The people like I, I made my horse. It took seven years. Um, people don't do that nowadays. People buy the horse that's ready to go and do it much faster. So it has changed. What do you think, Jay? I was I was looking for one of your stories about you and Diane at one of these Southwest horse shows. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I think she was aiming at. <laughs> um, yeah, I I I was such a weirdo. I rode so many horses. All I did was ride. So I don't remember too many stories. <laughs> uh, yeah, the horses um, today. I, I have to say that th I think the thoroughbreds have made a revival, and I'm very happy to see that. Um, it, it, what happened with the thoroughbreds, what happened was they got smaller, you know, the horses that Jenny and I used to ride, um, they were, they were a lot bigger thoroughbreds than the ones that were really being bred say 10, 15 years ago. I think some of the size is coming back, but the traditional American thoroughbred was 16, three, 17 hands, 17, one, um, big, big movers. Um, then the racehorse industry, you know, started to breed them smaller and smaller, for obviously hoping for more speed and i that was i believe part of the reason that the thoroughbreds went away from from the show jumping but i i see quite a few of them now in my travels and my clinics and i definitely think they're they're coming back um which i think is is a good thing because to me, a good horse is a good horse. I, I, it doesn't really matter what breed it is. As long as it does the job, whatever that job happens to be and does it great, then that's, that's a great horse. So, um, yeah. but style, style of rod, and, and certainly you see the difference in equitation, which, you know, we're talking here about riding position. You see such a difference in equitation now than, than the pictures, for, say, from the 70s and 80s. Um, part of the reason is they're different horses to jump over, jump over a fence. Um, you know, you had to do much more of the following release, much more release, much softer uh, feel, uh, much lighter in the seat than, say, the horses of 15, 20 years ago. Now, we're starting to see now, of course, in the past 10 years, these modern warm bloods are have a lot of blood. So you're yeah, they're starting they're they're getting a little bit uh, hotter or a little finer. Uh much more so. So you're seeing yeah. riders such as Ken Farrington who ride very soft and very light as a rider. Um, he, he actually rides in that standing up position. You started off, <laughs> um, you know, because, because of that and it worked. And again, fantastic. Um, so I think rider positions are evolving along with the, the sport, you know, and the, the courses are different. The tests are different. The jumps uh, are different. Jumps I mean, different. you think yeah. of, I mean, remembering when I started riding in the hunters, the first year greens were three foot six. Now, now you can start a horse show at, I don't know, two foot or something. <laughs> yeah. But, they've uh, got many heights now. Exactly. Um, and the, and the equitation horses are so specific that they're like computers. And, um, you know, back in the era of my young youth, I did my one hunter in all the classes. I mean, he had to be my equitation horse too. So it has changed um, and for the better, I think, I mean, but it is, you know, and the horses nowadays are so specialized and expensive that the kids can't always be kids on their horses. So we got to do that back then. Yeah. So that kind of brings us into our next topic here, being a horseman versus being a rider. Uh, that um, what's, the, what's the difference? Well, I believe a, a horseman comes in, doesn't necessarily have to feed their horse, but they know what it's eating. They know what it does. They know about its turnout. They know about its care. Um, they see it more than the 10 minutes they're riding it every day. And they want to know, um, you know, I can ask a horseman, what mood is your horse in today? And they'll know where riders like, I actually had a child look at me and say, they have moods. <laughs> so, so kids, you know, they're not just machines, they're animals. They have good days and bad days. And I enjoy the kids that want to know all of that. So, and, and adults, I mean, and I think it, when it's in your blood, you become a horseman, whether you want to or not, because you're doing it so much. 
So I just think it's better, you know, and, and the children that don't have their horses or have to go to them and have lessons, they can still study, read books, you know, watch people. I don't think people will watch as much as they should. Um, so, so there's lots of ways to learn, even if you don't own a horse. So it's all about wanting to learn. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, Jay, do you know people who are riders and not horsemen or people who are horsemen and not riders? I think if you're a horseman, you're yeah. probably a rider, but if you're... Yeah. It's um, no, I, I think those two things are, are very different. Um, mostly in, in America. Um, I think in Europe, uh, uh, there's more, uh, more horsemen's riders are more the same thing. Um, and I think in Canada more so as well. Um, in, in the U S it's, it's, uh, there, there's a difference there and I understand why it's developed that way, uh, from it, you know, it's just a societal thing. Um, it, I was going to say it's kind of cultural. If you're in, in mm -hmm. uh, Europe, it's a different horse culture, right? Uh, yeah. Some people have horses in their backyard, whereas in the U.S., uh, North America, it's probably not that way usually. It was, it was interesting when we were uh, actually in Thermal this year with my daughter and I. And so every evening at approximately 9 o'clock, you go and do night check, and you take the horses for about a you know 20 to 40-minute walk, hand walk, and graze them, and they love it. And um, literally, we were the only people <laughs> walking the horses at night. And if you're at, say, a show in Calgary, when you're hand walking at nine o'clock at night, you'll see, you know, 50 to 100 other people out there hand walking their horses. So it's, it's just a little different culture. But horsemanship is really key. And my advice to people is just like Jenny says, is, is watch. Uh, watch, let, watch the good riders and <laughs> don't watch the bad ones. Um, watch the good riders, go to the warm up ring, watch how people warm up, watch how they flat their horses. And, and I know this is intimidating, but ask questions. Um, there's shows like this with people like Jenny Paisley that you can ask questions to about horsemanship. Um, you can walk up to Richard Spooner, Ian Miller, McLean Ward and say, Hey, why are you doing this? And they will take the time to answer you. Um, <laughs> be, be, yes. And you have to be present and make sure you have time to listen to the answer. Don't expect them just to blow you off because they will talk to you. Oh yes. Yeah. They're, they're happy to impart that knowledge because you know, people, people that are horse, horse people, I know horsemen, I don't like that term necessarily as horse people. They, um, they love what they do and they want other people to, to love the horses in the same fashion and the same way. And it's, that's the, to me, the best part of the sport. It's, it's not about just winning the ribbons. It's, it's about the horses. And yes, you ride them in the show ring for 75 seconds and you ride them maybe for, you know, some people ride 30 minutes a day, you know, three, four times a week. The horse people are spending 16 to 18 hours a day with the horses. And so there's, there's a passion there. Maybe we're all a little bit loony and that that's okay. <laughs> and um, there's that passion there and, and everyone, people want to, to share that experience with others and you'll, you'll find a great reception and find the cowboys, you know, the good cowboys and, and spend time with them. Go on, go on a trail rides, go on a, go to a dude ranch, um, go fox hunting in, in the UK, you know, that, that's, that's how you, how you really learn. Spend time with your farrier, spend time with your pet. Right. How, how you learn. And the other thing I'd like to put in right now is be a sponge. Soak it all in. You don't have to keep everything you hear and make your own system too, because that makes you a thinking person. Because you might hear something from someone that doesn't make sense that day, and then a week and a half later, you feel it happen in your horse. And you're like, oh, that's what they were talking about. And I believe that all of riding is feeling, and until you feel it, you don't have it yet. You might know it in your head, but if you can't feel it, you haven't mastered, or well, not even mastered, you haven't even accomplished it yet. Anyway, be a sponge, try things. Yeah. And you don't know where you're going to find these people. Uh, mm -hmm. This past this past uh, winter, I was uh, bicycling, but we went to a bicycle shop and in because I had a puncture, and uh, over top of the doorway was a picture of somebody riding to the hounds. It's funny you should mm -hmm. say that about going fox hunting. So I said, "Look, look! There's somebody riding a horse! <laughs> Yay! A horse! A horse!" <laughs> and it was the the bicycle repair guy. We had a great chat because he was the the master of the the hounds he it, it was it was 
you don't know where you're going to learn one little tidbit about something that you've never learned about before. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. So we do have a picture. Would you guys like to look at a picture of, of uh, somebody Certainly. of something that somebody sent in to us for a bit of a critique? Certainly. Yeah. You ready for that? Yeah. Okay. So let's put this in here. Can you see that all right? I can. Am I first? You bet. Okay. I love this turnout. It's beautifully turned out. The ponies shiny, the kids well-dressed. Everything's fabulous. Um, it's a nice jump. It's coming down from the jump, so I'm not taking away anything of its jump. Um, to me, she has lovely feet because she has that little angle in her ankle. Now, it's not a huge jump, and I think she could have, as I call it, hold your hip angle open just two degrees, four degrees, and that would have helped your lower leg not kind of slide back because, again, that teeter-totter effect. If she just kept her leg by the girth just a hair more, her upper body would be three, two inches taller. Um, she has a nice release. Uh, if her body was taller, her elbow wouldn't have popped out, but I have no problems with that. I really like this picture. I think it's a great picture. I'm done. Yeah, that's, um, geez, I don't have much to add to that. I 100% concur with everything that Jenny said. Um, it's the release is lovely. You know, it's that following release that we talked about. Um, the automatic release, sorry, a couple weeks ago on, on this show. And so that's lovely. Um, she is slightly closed over, but again, the horse is, is coming down a bit here. So it could be that she's just, you know, looking to stay with the horse into the landing. Um, so, so that does cut the elbow to pop and, and, you know, and it causes the a slight pivot off of the knee as a result of that. So then the, you know, the lower leg is slid just a hair back. So, you know, to be picky, yes, the lower leg would be, you know, two inches, five centimeters more, more up towards the girth. The shoulder would be that much, just that little bit much taller and the hip angle would be say five to 10 degrees more open. But, um, it's it's a pretty ideal again the north american forge system of riding um is very evident here and she's jumping right in the center of the jump her eyes are up yeah. expression is good on the on the horse um it's it's pretty ideal i think jay what uh, i agree with both of you for sure and uh, and i think jay we talked about this and one of the other uh, pictures that we looked at in a previous program where you say that the front of the rider's leg should be near the back of the girth that that's ideal um yeah. i know so, that my leg wasn't always there but that is no. the goal yes yeah that's the kind of the goal so why why do you think this rider's leg has slipped back a little bit could it be because she's kind of tipped forward or is she pinching with her leg or is it a combination of things I would say it's a combination of those two things. And, and it could even be the fact, you know, with the, it appears she's wearing the joppers, um, you know, maybe, you know, with the tall boots, when she gets to that stage, that, that'll hold her there. Cause certainly when you're just in the joppers, there's not much holding you on. So you're going to tend to pinch a little bit more with your knee as a result of that. Um, but again, that's, I, I think I'm being pretty picky there. Um, you know, obviously it's a young rider wearing the joppers and it's, it's technically, um, I would say it's like a nine out of 10 position looks really good. I, I was going to ask you, would you give this person a score? How about you, Jenny? What would you give this rider for a score? I, I agree with Jay. It's really quite lovely um, in the picture. Again, you can't really score if it's not moving, but yeah, it's a lovely picture. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're giving you a nine on 10. Very nice. Thank you so much for sending the pictures in. And if you do have yourself have a picture that you'd like to send in to get comments from a judge uh, like Jenny, uh, then please send it, send in your pictures to equestrianslive at gmail.com. We'd love to see them and we'd love to hear your comments. So if there are people here who are watching, listening, uh, do you have comments uh, regarding this? And if you can see what we're talking about, that it's a lovely photo, and but we can see that the rider's leg is slipped back a little bit and her upper body's a little bit more forward. I'd like to see, what did you say, Jenny, about her upper body? You had a, or her hip? Just open her hip angle a bit. 
Which would <laughs> slow down the coming forward and it would support her, her lower leg would support that easier. So I, I call it opening the hip angle. Opening your, the hip angle. Yeah, your hip angle controls the latitude of your body, how far forward or how far tall. Yeah. Jenny, what, um, as far as working on your hip angle and, and would you have a training tip or an, an exercise at home that you, you like to work on with your students to, to improve that? Um, well, my standing up thing is a big one I do. And then I, um, in a gymnastic, I will ask them to like stand up over jump one and bend forward too far over jump two and then be perfect over three so they can practice just moving and learning how to control their movement and how that affects their lower leg and, and all that stuff. So it's just, it's kind of moving to learn how to be still is my thoughts. And, um, and I always discuss sitting, opening your hip angle for the downward transition because that's the same position you'll get the closer you get to the jump. So the horse learns. It's sort of a body break, I call it, so they can read your body language. And so I teach mine to hoe and stop in a position so that when I'm cantering at a jump, if they're not listening to the reins enough, I can sit up tall and they'll go, oh, she's doing something. <laughs> I better pay attention. So it's just learning to be independent again with your hip angle as you are with your shoulders and your elbows and everything. So it's, it's kind of like you, a domino effect, right? If you're, if your so. hip angle isn't strong, then your lower leg's not strong. Or if your lower leg isn't strong and Correct. your basic support isn't strong, then your upper body is not going to be there for you. Right. Cause if your leg flies backwards, your upper body has no place to go, but forward. So it's again, it's that same teeter totter effect having control. Oh, right. Teeter totter from your knee. Right. Okay. So I think you, you uh, mentioned something uh, when we did look at that photo that uh, you said that, you know, as a judges from a judge's perspective, what your immediate, immediate, um, flavor in that leaves in your mouth is wow this is great yeah, so very pleasant a uh, pleasant yeah so yeah, okay. so from the judges box uh, how important is it to give the judge a perspective like this when you're entering the ring um it, well first opinions are the best you know and I, I notice how pleasant the horse looks, the person's plan on how they start, because not everyone needs to come in and do the same starting. If your horse doesn't, my junior hunter trotted terribly. So I walked in the ring and I cantered because it was better for me not to show him the trot. It didn't help my score at all. And in fact, I never even went in a hat class with that horse. We just jumped and showed and I got to the garden three times with him. So it worked. Um, but so you, whatever will present you the best, like in equitation classes, just because some people sitting trot in, if you do a bad sitting trot, don't sitting trot, post in, show me your best thing. I want to like you. I sit in my judges book looking for what I want to like about you, not what you are doing wrong unless you show it to me too hard. So I think one thing people think judges are just, they're trying to find faults. And we're actually rooting for you to get 100 because that makes my day really fun when I see beautiful, beautiful trips. So, yes, the, the turnout, the how your horse feels and acts. Um, my hugest pet peeve is honestly sitting there watching people paint feet at the end gate when I could be judging them. I've never <laughs> changed the score because the feet were oily or not oily. But yet you've now made me wait five minutes. So plan your day to horse show and try to be prompt because it's a horse show. It's not a lesson. It's not everything. So anyway, I didn't mean to slide into a pet peeve, but that's one of them. No, that's that's great. I mean, uh, uh, d but doesn't the first impression, does the, the yeah, painted so nose I also kind of reflect on your first impression? Wow, that horse's hooves are shiny. Of course, once it takes 10 steps into the ring, it's, they, they're, once, they're in the sand, it gets all covered and... You bet. It is. Yes, it's a position. But if I'm sitting there watching you paint, getting your feet painted, that's sort of insulting in my book, because you could just you could walk in the ring knowing where you're going. And I won't know your feet aren't painted. But I now know your feet are painted. And now it's like, wow, get going. <laughs> 
So it's it's being polite. It's being prompt when you you know you're trying not to in, slow down everyone's day because that starts happening, and then pretty soon the ring goes so slow. You know, you want to help the horse show run smoothly. And granted, you don't need to rush into the ring and not know where you're going. But have a plan. That's my plan, you know, and not hold up everybody. So, yeah. And if you have a beautiful trot, trot a long time. Impress me. If you don't, just kind of get to work and let's see a beautiful first jump. I think sometimes people um, are worried about jump one and don't have the right rhythm. I like to have them just get onto one as if they were going up the first line. So start your course with the rhythm you want to finish with and not expect it to build and change because one rhythm is the best of the whole round. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun to judge. And, and we're not your enemy, we're your friend. We are trying hard to find the best rounds. And it's really fun when it's a really competitive class and we have to really be on our game. But um, and never give up, even if you think you made a mistake because you don't know what everyone else did. Finish your round as if it was the best round of your life, because in that class, it might be. So never judge I like yourself. <laughs> I, I like that uh, that tip. Uh, finish, uh, start the round with the candor that you finish, want to finish it with. Correct. So it's that's, all the same. That's, that's a great tip. That kind of sums everything up, I think. Cool. Excellent. Yeah, that, that is a great tip. I, I want to go back to the entering the ring question for you in the equitation division um, specifically, not so certainly not the hunters, but in the equitation, is there a right and a wrong? And I understand, you know, you said, okay, if you're not very good at the sitting trot, don't do the sitting trot, but I, what is the ideal entrance into the ring in the equitation? Well, we all have to walk through the gate for sure. And then if it's a high level metal class and the jump isn't far away, many people will just pick up the canter and get there. If your horse will do that well, that's excellent. If it won't do that well, by my, all means do a circle and give yourself the best shot of being good. Um, but no, I don't, I don't have a particular have to do this to be the winner. Be, impress me. Be the best you can be and be the best round. I think that I think as soon as you get into that gate, the judge can see and the riders can see and the horse can feel if the rider has a plan. Mm -hmm. And I think that if they kind of go in and go, I don't know what's happening, you know, what's the first jump again? <laughs> right. and they go, you know, if right. they don't have a plan, that comes across in your whole demeanor. Correct. But having to have a plan, I think is is important. Right. And, and like like Jenny says, if it's if they have a nice walk canter transition and they know exactly what's happening and they've got a plan and they stick to it, great. Right. And and it's just doing it as best as you can to show off yourself and your horse. And then in the equitation on the flat, um, even though we haven't started the class, by golly, you are being watched. I'm putting you on the card in my first impression of you. So for people that judge show in front of me, be your best in the first before the class even starts, because that's where I'm ranking you because I rank my groups, especially a big group. And then you have to have me see you. I can't have to find you because there are a lot of really pretty riders that ride around over in the core and they don't get seen and I might miss them, but that's not my job. My job is for you to present yourself as best you can. So I go, and I love watching you every time I see you. Whereas there are people I know that I liked how they rode, but they went and hid, as I call it. And, and, the, and we're talking a big hat class, you know, when, the, when you get to the 20 and 30 people. You got to work at letting me know where you are and how you do. So, um, so it's how you show also. I mean, you have to have beautiful equitation and be seen because sometimes you can just be hidden. So that's, that's a tactic. You have to practice writing a good hat class. I have, I have one more question for you as a judge. Okay. Um, and, it's, and I think it is, you know, we're talking about riding position, fix it here. So when it kind there's been a lot of discussion about this recently. Um, when you are judging a hunter class and you see a lot of the drama that the riders put into <laughs> the class, uh, right. in the hunter ring, how does that affect your judging? I understand you're judging the horse, 
Right. Um, but there's, you know, and again, many of the top hunter riders have even come out against this and saying, you know, there's too much movement and, and, you know, equitation should have some importance to the ride. How do you feel as a judge when you see a rider laying on the neck and twisting and throwing their hands up and into the ears and in very dramatic? Well, I'm judging the whole picture and the smoothest picture, the evenest picture, the most non-noticeable of anything happening to me is the best. Uh -oh. And thinking when they get all dramatic is they're, they're trying to hide something or show something. And it just proves to me that they maybe don't believe in their horse that much. I believe, you know, it wouldn't really change. You're, I'm still going to give you the score of a very nice trip if you have a beautiful trip. But if you had two people that have the same beautiful trip and one's flying all over and the other one's being quiet, that might be the tiebreaker. So I would, I think it goes to be more of a tiebreaker option, if that makes sense. And, um, you know, and, and it's, it's just how it, you know, how lovely is your horse and how nice you ride it around and be smooth. And I don't know, does that answer your question? Yes. No, I, 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 we're on the same page there as far as, and again, I'm not, I'm not looking at it from a judge's point of view, but from a coaching and rider's point of view, the, the drama and, and I, I'm actually trying to get this started at some of the horse shows. We'll see how it goes, but I, I would like to see where you have classes, which are judged on both horse and rider. I, I don't, honestly, I don't understand the concept of why only the horse is judged in the hunters and why only the rider is judged in the equitation. I, that seems odd to me um i really think the ultimate test should be both should be being judged and i understand what you're saying but you're not technically giving the rider a score right um, i think right. it would to me a, a true hunt a true class and test would be giving the rider a score and giving the horse a score and that would be the ultimate champion because you'd have right. the best horse and the best rider do you right. think it should be 50 50 equal weight between uh, horse and rider? Well, in my opinion, I always, when people ask me, oh, well, you know, how much does a rider really do? And da 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 da. da. <laughs> this is, um, you know, it is a team sport. One cannot do it without the other. Correct. And, and I, as a coach, I'm always advocating saying, you're, you're a teammate to your horse. Is Correct. Where you you're not, you know, this is not an individual sport. Um, you need to take responsibility for your, for what you're doing and you need to work with your horse, just like you'd be working with your tennis partner or your volleyball partner or soccer, but whatever it happens to be. So to me, um, what I want to see is you'd have the rider judged and you'd have the horse judged. And to me, the best team wins. That's, that's how I look at it. But I, 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 I don't know how this all developed, but that's uh, what, what are your, Jenny, what are your thoughts, you know, quickly on that? Well, um, I think that. The, the rider is a, a big part and the horse is a big part and the equitation was maybe I mean invented so that the person with not the best horse could actually win some stuff <laughs> because again you judge the rider versus just the horse um, but I think if you don't ride well you're not going to find good distances and the hunters aren't going to be that great either so it, yeah it would be very interesting I also remember back in California many years ago they were such big shows they would have two judges and one judge the equitation and one judge the hunter on the same course and I, they did that um, just to make the horse show run faster and the horses didn't have to jump so many rounds so so that's your idea kind of um, how, did, how did that go um, well they pinned two different sets of ribbons and two different people got you know it, it was usually the winner won both but often it wasn't um because but people came in and they weren't doing any of the fancy schmancy lay up the neck and all that because they were equitating so so you kind of cleaned up the problem right there but um because i think you know equitation you can't have the floppy rain but a beautiful hunter with a floppy rain to me is gorgeous so mm -hmm. it's two different definitions and and that's you know so you, you kind of have to be careful there but um anyway it's very interesting but yeah i think I think the people, the pretty rounds are all, everybody cooperates and everything's pretty. Because <laughs> um, the, the, the drama and the jumping up the neck sort of just makes you wonder what they're covering up. So. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. So we are getting down to the wire here. Does uh, anybody who's watching here now, if you have any comments or questions, I see there's a comment here from Dot. 
Suto Graves, thank you for the information on entering the ring and being seen the moment you enter and showing yourself to the judge. Thanks for the co comments on the child and Pony. We are working on keeping her body up a tad more over the fence. Pony was a trail horse nine months ago. Well, they're, they're doing a beautiful job. Yes, and so, great turnout too with yes. respect to that. Now, Jay, you didn't give me an answer with respect to uh, how you're going to weight the equitation and hunter round. Oh, 50 50. 50 In fact, 50. I think it would be great, you know, we had the, if you took the, the hunter derby format and you had, say, two judges that judge solely the rider and two judges that judge solely the horse. And so you'd have, or different panels, it wouldn't have to be two and two. It could be one and yeah. one, it wouldn't matter. But you'd have two, you know, essentially you'd have a score for each um, and they'd be separate. So you wouldn't, you know, as a judge, you you could just focus on the horse or just focus on the rider. Right. Um, I, I think that would be, uh, I'm working on getting into one of the top show circuits right now, that idea. Um, I, I think that'd be very entertaining for spectators. I think it would be, um, a very a unique class and a fair class. And I think if you did it as like as an evening feature that, you know, you, and you wouldn't even have it, a, I'd have it more as a style of riding than equitation. I, I don't, I don't think, you know, cause again, somebody would take that equitation. They'd sit up there and do a short crest release and, and put a broom up their back. You know, we don't want that. Of course. Um, <laughs> want to do it as a style of riding. And I remember the watching this. I remember, the uh, yeah. Well, and, and the most effective, the, who most looks effective. best and most effective. And I remember watching the Europeans when they did the hunter challenge in Las Vegas and they, they decimated the American hunter riders um, in the challenge. And the, the Europeans rode so beautifully on these hunters, um, which they'd never sat on before um, because they did what Jenny just said. They just sat there and were still and were effective. And um, I think that style of riding would be, um, uh, an interesting, it'd be an interesting class and it'd be a good class for coaches to watch spectators to watch. Right. That would uh, be fun. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're going to be winding things here up, but winding things up here. Uh, Jenny, uh, any more words from you with respect to, uh, the hunters and hunter horse shows? Uh, my biggest thing is be a forever student. Always work on getting better. And you'll learn things as you go all along and do the best you can and have fun. Have fun. Um, fun is the most reason we do this, I hope. So, and thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome, Jenny. It's been my pleasure. And uh, Jenny's been a lifelong horse lover. And um, again, she's available for clinics. And we've had so much fun with you today, Jenny. I really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, Jay, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, we have an exciting show coming up Monday evening, 7.30 East, 4.30 Pacific. We have Derek Braun is coming on the show. He's the founder of the Split Rock Jumping Tour. And we're going to talk about how the shows are going to resume here in 2020, coming up in June in the U.S., um, the protocols that are going to be in place for that, and, and the future of show jumping in America, where he sees it going. The Split Rock Tour is very revolutionary in, in what he's doing, and I'm excited to hear his thoughts on his on how he's going to progress his shows into, into the twenties. Excellent. And we also, the jumping instructors live has another show here, uh, on, uh, Friday at 1 PM Eastern. And would love to see you here for that as well. And again, uh, Monday night is Jay Dukes, the Jay Duke show. And next Wednesday, again, we will be here and our guests next Wednesday. Oh, I don't know who that is. Guest is next Wednesday. I think it might be Anne. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week. And thank you so much, Jenny. Really appreciate you coming and taking thank time you. out of your schedule to uh, talk with us and share your information. We've got some great tips to try out. So thank you so much, Jay. And thank you so much, Jenny. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. It's my All pleasure. Right. We'll see you next time.